Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Yes, hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm Tyler Alderson, your host for today as we talk about genies and other mythological creatures, Orientalism, and also uh, doing history and presenting history in some pretty interesting places online. Uh, we're talking about all of that with uh, Laura Castro Royo, uh, who is joining us Uh she is a PhD candidate at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and uh, also uh, runs the project Las Plumas de Simurg on uh, Twitch and podcast and uh, uh, blog, all kinds of stuff uh, that we are going to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, Laura, thank you so much for coming on. Hi, Tyler. Thank you so much. I am so blessed to be here. This is very exciting to me. So thank you, Ask Historians in general, for inviting me and having me over. I'm pretty sure we're going to have a great time talking about all those interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I wanted to get into first, which is kind of the, the gateway into the, the larger topics we're going to be talking about, is the idea of genies or I, I guess i should really be saying gin here um and mm -hmm. we can uh talk about genies in the sense of the uh islamic tradition and in the sense of the the scholarship you've done um but i think most people as soon as i say genie they have one picture in mind and that is a big blue thing that is voiced by exactly. robin williams uh that was in aladdin um there are Many, many other depictions in popular culture, uh, generally involving some kind of lamp and three wishes, but certainly Aladdin was huge on that. Can you uh, maybe explain uh, at the start uh, what exactly a djinn is and maybe a little bit as to, to how it differs from the genie that we know, how it is the same and, and, and how it got to be known as the genie in popular culture? Oh, definitely. That is actually one of my favorite topics to talk about. It could, I'm going to summarize it up a little bit. We're going to do a brief covering of this because it's a topic so wide it could take like streams of ink, <laughs> definitely. But don't worry if the first thing that you actually presented in your head when encountering the word genie is the genie that sings with Ali Baba, the furry beast to her, that had a thousand tails. You're exactly correct. That is a gene and it's a genie. But we're going to see a little bit of the difference. And uh, we're, while it's not entirely wrong, it has its things. We're going to touch and twitch some uh, things in here. So first of all, we should ask ourselves, who are the jinn or perhaps what they are? Because the jinn are supernatural creatures that already existed in pre-Islamic Arabia and they were integrated within Islamic religion and Islamic cosmology. Um, the cosmology and the cosmography is the, the understanding that each religion has of how the world came to be and how the world works. So um, the gene, so this is very interesting to highlight and actually very important to note. Even if there's been an effort of trying to present them as demons, they are not. The gene are spirits and they could be beneficial and they could be very, very wicked and very hurtful for humanity. But it would not be correct having the Judeo Christian association of a Mephistophelic demon, you know, with color red, associated with fire. So it's not exactly that. It's important to note that jinn are spirits, and uh, these spirits do not like to be disturbed, basically. And the word jinn comes from the Arabic verb jan, which can be translated as to adapt, to hide, to occult. Because, well, I mean, the word gene is already a plural, but you can actually see it used both ways. Sometimes it's pluralized like Jean and singular as genie, but it's it's fine to use gene for both singular and plural. And as Tyler just said, the gene appeared in popular culture and fantastic European culture around the... Towards the end of the 19th, very early in the 20th century, with the first translations of, you guessed it, The One and a Thousand Nights, which is a poem of Arabic tradition that gathers this. Do you know this Shaheri Sada with a thousand tales the genie sang about? 
this is the one. This is the Shahari Sada of the uh, One in a Thousand and Nights. And I don't know uh, if we have a, just two minutes to explain what that is. It's basically a very long poetry collection with tales, with fables, and with very interesting stories. And among them, there's a lot of jinn or genies. But the figure of the jinn that came into European popular culture was this creature anchored and sometimes chained to a physical object that can grant wishes. And basically that exists to fulfill humanity's desires. And that is not entirely correct because jinn were free spirits with their own will in the Near East, whereas the genie that came to be in popular culture is much more a slave to the wishes of a human he is surrogated to. Does that make any sense? Yes, absolutely. So that uh, the thing with the wishes came from the story of Aladdin, which is, is included in the one in, a thousand, uh, one in a Thousand Nights. I keep on saying one and a thousand one, so that makes it one thousand and two. No, it's one <laughs> and a thousand nights. <laughs> so, um, so he, Aladdin actually, um, spoiler alert, he's not Arabic, Aladdin in the original tale, he's Chinese. And in his story, there's not one, but two jinn. There's a jinn in the lamp and there's a jinn in a ring he is given. And I do not remember if there's a limit to the wishes, but basically the jinn is, um, he addresses Aladdin as his master. And both of the jinn, the jinn from the ring and the jinn from the lamp, they help Aladdin quite a lot because he, let me tell you, Tyler, he messes up. <laughs> Isn't it a bit of a brat? He's not nice. And uh, I have to admit that if he, would he had not have the jinn to save his soul, there would be no tale of Aladdin. But yeah, you know, the supernatural aid, if anyone is familiar with the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell, they would know about the supernatural aid. In this case, the jinn at supernatural aid. So this is, this account of the War in a Thousand Nights started being very, very popular in European culture. And through all the 20th century they got adapted to films they got adapted to video games because Tyler let me ask you a question do you like video games so I I am actually not a video game player um I I have never really gotten into them uh but I know that they are you know obviously huge cultural kind of force it's kind of a blind spot for me in terms of pop culture to be honest Oh, I love them. I'm a very big player. So for those listening that know a little bit about video games, maybe you're familiar with the saga Golden Sun. In the Golden Sun, there are these tiny, very cute, funky, Pokemon-like creatures that are called the Jinn. That is not a Jinn, okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's not a Jinn. It's a, I, you know, they, they could have been named any other way and it would have been the same, basically. But that is... That's how, that's one of the latest adaptations of the word genie or gen in, um, in modern media. And it differs quite, differs quite a lot. There's this um, stereotypes on the figure of the gen. And basically, uh, well, I should say the genie. Yeah, because the genie is the European, like the European adapted, Western adapted creature. And this genie as I said, is not contemplated as a free spirit with their own will. Because, for example, in Islam, the jinn could form families. They have their own names. They could be believers or not. They could uh, form communities. And they have a lot of personality. There are ranks of jinn. There are types of jinn. And the most important part to it is that since they were created as part of God's great creation, they are contemplated as, as free creatures. You could use them to serve you but normally the folklore and the tradition tell you to not to not bother them <laughs> like just leave them be because uh this is very interesting in islam um the world has different realms or places of existence and one of them would be the the world we are inhabiting right now this world where me and tyler are sitting in front of our computers and then we have Al Ghaib, and Al Ghaib literally means the occult, where the things that we cannot see dwell. 
And that's the thing. The interesting thing about this realm is that we, through our human pupils, cannot see them, but al Ghaib exists. And here is where the real demons, because they are real demons that are not the jinn, the jinn, the demons, the angels, and all the creatures inhabit. And all of them, they have to respond to God to a certain extent. Because remember, this is an Islamic cosmology, and we're talking about God's creation. God created absolutely everything. Yes, that includes the jinn. And uh, they're very interesting because they have this liminal status of existence. They are in the in the middle. They're stuck in the middle with you. And that is too many um, popular songs references. But yeah, I mean, that's that's who we are. <laughs> so they are in the middle. So they are, they are and they are not. They transit different realms and they can merge into one or the other. They're very interesting. So when you compare all this information... With the genie from Aladdin, I'm really sorry, Robert Williams, you are charismatic as hell, but that is not exactly what a gene is. It's what a genie has been created for us to think, you know, the rubbing the lamp, getting three wishes, and using the third one to set the gene free. Ah, not quite. <laughs> I I actually, uh, it, that's that's something that distinction is... I think a really important one, and I, I wonder, you know, to what extent, you know, do we have to think of the the genie as as really simply a kind of a Western uh, concept, almost you know, divorced from its actual origin in the jinn, Be- because it does sound just so, you know, so different from the, different, the quote, authentic yeah. jinn. It's it's very interesting because I would say is very very it's departed very much from the original concept because please do not understand because I should I think I should make this disclaimer in Islam and in folklore and in tradition the gene do intertwine their lives with the humans and it is true we have the gene the granting wishes genie we have it from somewhere and that is from the one and a thousand uh, nights but. That is just one example of many different creatures. And uh, we have other books that deal with the jinn in a very different way. But sometimes, often even, the jinn, they interact with humans and they communicate. Um, This is something that um, I think is interesting to, to observe, is that in many countries to this day, the jinn are something people believe in. They are they are blamed by diseases, uh, by uh, they, they are blamed for droughts and uh, times of like very heavy rain. So there's there's still communities in in the Middle East where the gene play a very significant role in the. I really I'm going to use these words because they're my favorite words to use. The self defining narrative. This this self defining narrative is basically the discourse that defines a community or a culture, and the gene play a major part in it because they represent the world the world of the occult, which a lot of people believe that exists. And for a lot of people, it's still real. I mean, uh, some of my friends still uh, tell tales about how their grandparents used to lull them to sleep with little funny tales about jinn or about all the supernatural creatures and how that has become a very important part of them uh, growing up. However, these genes have nothing to do or very little to do with the Western genie. So yeah, I would say the genie, the wish granting genie is a complete Western creation and it's very detached. And this is something that um, we have to blame, quote unquote, on um, on something very <laughs> not funny, which is called Orientalism. Because uh, these how do we how do we go from genie from the gene to the genie the mythology normally is perceived as something performative and that is something mark arlen peterson said about the gene but in in cinema and uh, these performance is anchored and adapted to a very precise image and this genie is rooted in this idea this growing idea of a uh, global folklore where all the traditions and all the mythologies have their place, but but by doing so, 
the entertainment industries, they they get appropriate with images, like local images. They transform them, they adapt them, and they deform them, and then they make them circulate all uh, around the globe. And and this is something that's happened with the genie. Um, I don't know if I'm making any sense with this. <laughs> no, that that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Thank you. I sometimes, you know, when I talk about this, I just get very excited, and I just feel like I am rumbling for a very long time and i just do not know if i am being followed that's the reason i like twitch because <laughs> my audience there can tell me sorry Lau, but we're not following so, <laughs> <laughs> so um the gene to the genie has been anchored powerfully to a scheme within this consumed society because this figure serves is a slave to humanity they obey, they act, but they do not ask questions. Have you ever thought about the three limits that the, the genie had for Aladdin? Like, you, I cannot kill people. I cannot make people fall in love with each other. And, and how, oh, and I cannot resurrect. I cannot bring anyone from the dead. Actually, these limits, they, they could not apply because the genie, uh, I haven't mentioned this, but Tyler, let me tell you, they are, incredibly powerful they have their own ranks and everything there's this type of gene they call the ifrit wow you really want to get away from those because no deals with them they're not playing any games they're just destructive creatures run away run away never never come close to an ifrit ever i'm serious i am not taking responsibility for any gene encounters for the ask historian listeners from this moment onwards <laughs> i'm not gonna take any responsibility so um but as as I was saying, this uh, this figure has been so transformed. This magical creature with power of will, with their own stories to tell, with their own will and personality, suddenly is turned into this thing with the capacity of granting wishes, and that fits perfectly. And also, this is something Mark Allen Peterson has said: is fits perfectly in a model of society whose objective is just the obtention of goods of wealth so we have the creature with will personality capacity of decision and then we have a blue dancing figure with a little swing in it not gonna lie but just serves it doesn't ask it never questions i think aladdin is a great example for when, when aladdin is just telling oh i want to trick this woman so she believes i'm a prince or when jafar as I'm hoping everyone's seen Aladdin. If not, I'm really sorry for the spoilers, but it's been a while, people. <laughs> and um, We don't you know, have to worry Jafar about was... spoilers for Aladdin, I, I don't think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, when Jafar asks for, he wants to be the world's most powerful wizard or that he just wants to be Sultan, the genie doesn't question. Maybe the movie makes the genie question a little bit because he's another very relevant character for the plot, but the genie does it all the time without questioning. That applied to the video game world is very similar. And in all the other um, representations of the genes, uh, it's just that. That's what we understand by a genie, which is like, hmm, not quite, <laughs> not, not quite. And of course, then we move to the aesthetic of the gene. I would love to know where the color blue came from i don't know that i have no idea but if you see the depictions of the jinn and i am thinking for example about the saga heroes of might and magic and um although all the saga which is a guild wars um, or final fantasy all these creatures actually i'm going to stick with guild wars uh with guild wars and might and magic i'm sorry the video games but basically you see the the gene being well, the genie actually being represented in this very orientalistic manner with turbans sometimes. If they're female, they have uh, the parts of the body exposed instead of sensuality going about it. There's gold, there's, um, there is this lavish decoration on them, this opulence that sometimes is still connected to these 19th century painters of, quote unquote, the Orient. Because the Orient inspires a lot of mystery and uh oh my god that's not good I mean, <laughs> this is the very orientalistic approach to it because the orient is 
The land of the one thousand tales is mystical, is strange, is foreign, is exotic. She's like, no, it's just another place. And you should not think of it as exotic because that's not nice. But you see, in, the, in just cherry picking this inherited taste for foreign cultures, thank you 19th century and thank you Orientalism for absolutely nothing. And um, in, in inheriting this and projecting it into modern media, we can see how these stereotypes still linger to this day and they have a huge impact in the, the products we consume, uh, video games, films, Everything, even in the newest film of Aladdin, where if I'm not, it's Will Smith, right? I think uh, I am yes. correct. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the latest one was uh, Will Smith is the genie, and I remember seeing some very weird uh, photos of him as the genie that just it just didn't look right. Um, I never saw the movie, so I, I don't know whether. Uh... <laughs> I haven't watched it myself, but still, you see there, there, there's been an effort into researching something that looks much more like India, Islamic India in some parts of it. But still, there's a lot of visual stereotypes of the subject because, again, we're still making, adapting a Disney film because the public is used to consume certain visual images and certain archetypes and tropes and visual tropes and they feel comfortable with it uh and this comfort um comes from in the case of the genie the blue the you know swinging attitude the servile attitude like i am your slave i'm just gonna please you boy whatever wimp you come <laughs> whatever whim you come across your head it's fine i'm gonna do it so yeah, that's a that's very different from the gin I normally work with and the gym I the gin I know not the gym. I'm not like is that about working out? Is this the way that these occult creatures have to tell me that I should work out? I am going to. I promise. <laughs> well that that's something that's that's really I find very telling that these these powerful creatures um, that, you know, as you mentioned, uh, do not necessarily, they can, I guess, operate against the interests of certain humans or potentially for them, but they're not evil. The depictions in, you know, Western media are almost entirely either servile or they're evil or, or both, which, which obviously says a lot about oh, the, they are very uh, evil. The Sometimes they are. <laughs> That, yeah, that some, they are thought of and the way that yeah, the sometimes, Middle East yeah, do not of. Do not get me wrong with this. All right, this is, they're not evil per se, if you know what I mean. But if you annoy them, they're going to respond. Oh, and they are very bitey creatures. And <laughs> some of them are very mean and very evil. Some of them are. But some of them can be nice sometimes. I mean, I remember this uh, story. I don't know how it came to me. I don't know if I listened to it. Some of my friends told me about that, but... There was a person's grandmother, and she always said that in the house there lived a jinn, and his name was Musa. And uh, he was a very nice jinn, and he lived there for a while, and then he left. And um, I'm talking about someone from this century. So, like, that is something that still is believed on. So that would be an example of a nice jinn. But there are a lot of jinn, and they're not nice. The, the, um, de verdad, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, they're they're not. That's the thing that the fact that they're not evil. I think I said that to express how they're not inherently, how they're not naturally gonna find humans to eat them alive, for example, or to punish them, or just to pull their hair, or just I don't know, give them a cold or something like that. But in the Islamic culture, there's this emphasis in not disturbing the status quo. And by that, I mean, do not disturb the occult. Because if we cannot see the gene, there's a reason for it. So do not annoy them. Do not come. For example, uh, you know how this is my favorite part of mythology. You know how mythology was used to explain the inexplicable. So uh, the gene living in living liminal spaces, they, they place the potential threat in a remote location, which indicates you should not venture into those locations alone. I'm talking about uh, swamps, I'm talking about cliffs and mountains and just wastelands where one should not go by themselves, 
at any cost because it could it could be very it could be awful for you. You could die over there. Like I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm taking you back to the Middle Ages when that used to be thought. And um, right now that is the the teaching of do not mess with your cult is there for a reason. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting talking about the jinn because they represent, they physically embody the occult. And uh, in the Persian manuscripts and Arabic illustrated manuscripts that we have, they come in the greatest variety of shapes and colors, and they're amazing. Some of them are very anthropomorphic. For example, there's this manuscript in the um, National Library of, of Paris in France, and it's a manual of magic. It's, it's fantastic. It's the BNF Persan 174. And they, in their pages, in the pages, there is representation of the seven mighty king of the jinn. One of my favorites is called Al-Ahmar, which means the red one. And they're very anthropomorphic and they have wings, so they could be mistaken as angels. It's super interesting. This. I'm sorry, I'm getting carried away. But, <laughs> no. so, but there's not an aesthetic of it. You see how we portray, if I, if I ask you to draw or to think of the genie from Aladdin, you will be like, there's a st- an aesthetic, a particular aesthetic to it. Blue, baggy pants, uh, some gold earrings perhaps, turban, or maybe this funky ponytail they have on top of the head, whereas actually the jinn come in a lot, in a very varied shapes and sizes. So, yeah. Something that you, you mentioned, I think is really important when we're talking about a modern context, which um, in the West, we like to think of as kind of a secular, you know, concept. Um, but it's the fact that, as as you said, there are people who still interact with jinn in in their lives. This is not a dead concept. We're not talking about you know Greek mythology mm-hmm. or something where where there aren't uh, necessarily many living practitioners of it. Or you know, insert whatever mythology. I'm sure there's someone who believes in Zeus out mm-hmm. there. Um, but the the point being that there are a lot of people who uh, very much feel uh, like the jinn are a part of this world. And yet um, they are generally used as are most, uh, you know, cosmologies outside of the, you know, Christian one. Um, They are generally used as a kind of a fictional um, element. And, you know, you you talk about video games, about Mm -hmm. movies. They're, They're understood by Western audiences not to be real. Um, in a way that is kind of divorced as well from that that context of of people actually saying no that these are real things these are these are things that uh, I believe exist in this world absolutely and sometimes they still the the gene are blamed for a lot I mean they've been they have been blamed throughout history uh, for a high number of diseases. But to this day, there's still people who believe that mental mental illnesses are possessions by genes. And this is something quite that I would like to link with, you know, how these horror films about demonic possessions and people practicing exorcisms and stuff. So that is believed in the Islamic world as well. Sometimes people are believed to have been possessed by a jinn. And when you formulate this, is understood here in the West as much more fantasy or fiction, or maybe a lack of understanding. But at the same time, you think, hey, there's at least three new exorcism films released every single day in theatres. So why is that possible? And the gene is not. Because at the end of the day, the mimicking, you know, this is the same concept. A supernatural creature possessed a body and is making it, behave strangely, dangerously towards other human beings. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 very much the case that, you know, a lot of beliefs, especially beliefs outside of um the kind of the Christian uh worldview are are taken almost as well yeah, but that's not really true, is it? People will say, for example, mm-hmm. here here in the US they will talk about uh, Native American, you know, various Native American cosmologies, and they'll say, "Oh, the 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 Navajo believe X Y Z." While while 
making it obvious that that well that isn't true you know oh the exactly. navajo it's believe this but they, they, this yeah. is this is one of their myths whereas people would not and 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 you would get a lot of offense, I think, if you started treating, you know, Christian cosmology, Christian, um, and to to a lesser extent, some of the other, you know, uh, people like to talk about Judeo-Christian, generally speaking, Mm -hmm. it's it's just Christian, but, you know, some other faiths as well, treating them as if they are fictional in that way. Yeah, definitely. And also, it's... um... I don't know how to explain this, actually, but um, there's this feeling of foreign attached to everything regarding the jinn and the Islam. And also, I... All right, this is a little bit of an anecdote, but I remember one of my close friends, she's a Muslim, and I asked her one day, do you believe in the jinn? Do you believe they exist? And... um, she told me, I like to think they are there because I like to think that angels also exist. Therefore, if the angels are there, the jinn have to be there. And I haven't mentioned this, but the jinn actually appear in the Quran, in the Holy Book of Islam. So that is a very big deal because the Quran is a book of revelation. That's a word of God. So if they're there they occupy a major position in the construction of the world in uh, in Islam and the understanding, this narrative that defines what Islam and Islamic religion are. And I think that's super interesting. Another, another one of my friends, another Muslim friend, uh, they told me uh, that, yes, perhaps they're there. And they, they do not know this is so common. But to when you address this from a more Western and, as you said, secular point of view, it surprises you that some people believe in this kind of spirit, but hey, people believe in angels and guardian angels. So if the angels are there, what prevents the jinn from being there too? That's that's exactly the parallel I was thinking about with with angels. Certainly, that's something that that a lot of people will discuss, or with ghosts. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of people uh, will believe in ghosts in some form. Um, and exactly. is a ghost being in a house any different than the, the gin that you mentioned earlier being in the house? That's it's that's... just a matter of labeling and of putting different names to it. Because as I said at the start, a gin is a spirit. So that, that could be understood as gin. Or for example, there is another creature from Iranian folklore, they call Badi. And they are, they were assimilated into Islam as some kind of angel quote unquote and actually in afghanistan in india and pakistan they're understood as again quote unquote fairies but let me tell you something tyler let me share this piece of knowledge with you parties they're not nice (laughs) they are mean (laughs) and they are hurtful and these ones do target and prey on humans they are reckless mean creatures (laughs) creatures <laughs> so <laughs> so what is the difference of between you know if um if a film was to be made and they want to locate it i don't even know where but what would be the difference between having a ghost and then calling it something else say a party a gin this is because we're adapting we are adapting the folklore to make it palatable for a bigger audience which is the Western audience. And this is why I like that more and more independent studios are creating video games. I'm really sorry, back to the video games. Apologies. But uh, there's a lot of, no, actually I can talk about novels as well. There's a lot of authors, Muslim authors that are creating their own fantasy stories within Islamic tradition. And that is gorgeous. And you see there a lot of mythological creatures from Islamic background and from Iranian and Arabic background. Also, there's independent video game studios that are putting the folklore, you know, they're bringing it to the front page saying that we have this too. And it's just as cool as yours. And uh, I don't know, I I can see the change. The change is being produced and I really like it. And... uh, I think it's fantastic because at the end of the day, if we want to take it as fantasy, everything is allowed then because it's fantasy. So the same, you have demons, you can have angels and you can have jinn and parties and a myriad of other creatures from different folklores. I like this global, this idea of a global folklore, but at the same time, I can see how it can be detrimental depending on how it's adapted and how it's cropped 
and cherry picked in some aspects because to me cutting off the personality of the gin that that is a loss because you're not fully understanding the creator you're not fully comprehending what are they about if you just have a genie i am they're very boring they don't do much <laughs> they just come on i mean which of the gin which of the gin that i've studied this is a rhetorical question but you can answer if you want which one of the powerful mighty gin that i've studied would agree to trap themselves into a tiny lump and serve humans <laughs> hint the answer is not a single one of them oh come on we're talking <laughs> about the big ones here like no like oh, excuse me would you like living in this tiny shoe just coming out whenever i need you to i don't know clean my house get me a new hairdresser or buy me a palace yeah for sure i mean <laughs> wow i cannot wait excuse me no 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 so yeah now you know jeans are much cooler than genius and that's a hill i am willing to die on well, all right. Yeah. Speaking of, so the, the hill you're willing to die on, you, you are sort of taking this, um, the, this research that you've done and these, these concepts that you're talking about, um, and you're bringing to them to people, not, uh, you know, or not only, I should say, through your standard uh, academic routes. Um, I am everything but... but a standard academic. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but through some routes that I think, speaking of video games, people maybe more associate with uh, video game streamers, uh, things like Twitch. Um, you have this uh, this project, uh, Las Plumas de Simurg. Can you just give a, a, a brief uh, overview of of what exactly you're you're doing with this, and uh, why it is that you've chosen the outlets that you've chosen? Yeah, absolutely. So Las Plumas de Simurg literally translate as the feathers of Simurg. Simurg is the bird I am writing my thesis about and my favorite creature from all mythologies, from all the world, from all existence. She's queen in the heavens and she's amazing. She's this fantastic bird from uh, Iranian uh, literature and mythology. Maybe some other time we're going to talk about her. And um, basically I started this project in 2014 because I realized I started specializing in Iranian art history because I'm an art historian and I realized how little there was about art history and Islamic culture and Iranian culture in um, Spanish because I started it as a monolingual uh, project but quickly I jumped into English because I pursued uh, an English speaking academic path and also even if there is a little bit more about Iranian studies, normally they are stuck in a very close academic circles. And it's eventually, it's opening, slowly but steadily, it's opening a little bit towards the public. And I love that. I love public engagement and I love sharing all of these things because I am of the opinion, Tyler, that history did not, does not belong to academics. History and art and heritage is everyone's. And we should be there to to grant an easier access to it because we, the, the experts, the academics, we are the ones that can make easy what is difficult. And um, I started the project. I had a blog over the years. And then I, moved, I have profiles on social media, which is Twitter and Instagram. And then recently I moved to Twitch. If anyone doesn't know what Twitch is, is a streaming platform normally used to play video games, which I do sometimes. Yeah, occasionally I play video games. However, what I do is I live stream twice a week about a topic. And the topic, I mean, the project and everything is supported via Patreon, which is a, um, it's a patron system. I don't know how, I have to describe Patreon. How will you describe Patreon, Tyler? I have no idea how to. I guess crowdfunding to a certain extent. I don't know whether yeah. that's like the, 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 the right way, but people, uh, we actually have a, 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 a Patreon for, uh, um, for this podcast. Essentially, you can go on, uh, you can pledge a certain amount, uh, you know, per month or per episode or, or however, and uh, people can support the projects that they like through that. Usually it's just, I think, what yours is like the you know three dollars a month or something like that uh, mm -hmm, you know up yeah. to 13 a month it's it's something that is is relatively affordable but is also a way to 
uh, directly support rather than um, exactly uh, rather than just ad revenue or having to you know sell a book or something like that exactly um, uh, but yeah it's it's very very great because uh, people understand that this takes time and the research that I present so easily twice a week it takes a little of time because I need to research and I need to um, you know I just do not have all this knowledge in my head I wish. <laughs> I wish my head was actually the library of Marare, but it's not. It's definitely not. Um, there is, I don't know, it's like an empty room and there's someone dancing in the corner to a tune they invent. I don't know what my head is anymore. <laughs> a train wreck and no one's driving. So um, basically uh, through Twitch, I love sharing different topics and I cover normally Islamic and Iranian stuff, but also Mesopotamian because... I'm a sucker for Mesopotamian mythology and culture. I love it. I still need to learn a lot about it, but I'm on, you know, slowly, just baby steps. I'm getting in there. So it's been amazing. I actually do it bilingually. And of course, because my native language is in Spanish and because there's all the people doing the same in Spanish, my community in Spanish is a little bit bigger, but I'm really trying to, because I have patrons and I have uh, followers that can only speak English or they just like they understand me in English and not in Spanish. So I wanted it to be a bilingual project from the very start, the Twitch channel. So that's the reason I do both of it is twice <laughs> the amount of work, but I think it's worth it. And um, the feeling of creating a community and the feeling you get when people tell you, wow, I didn't know this was here and I would love it. It's like, yeah, for sure. It's it's for everyone. It's for everyone to enjoy. Absolutely everyone. And um, it's normally different because Islamic art is not the most popular art or the most popular history. If you dig a little deeper, there's a lot of people that are interested on it. But speaking about public engagement, I haven't seen many projects. Uh, there's few projects I know about the Middle East, for example, there's um, Trevor's podcast, History of Persia. There's also the King of Kings podcast. And, uh, you know, there's people doing things, but about medieval Iran, I haven't seen that many. And certainly I have not seen many talking about the jinn. So, and other mythological creatures, because something I talk about a lot, apart from jinn and simulk, are dragons. I love dragons. They are, everything's better with dragons. Okay. It's just like pin, pin that thought. Put a pin on it. Everything is better with dragons. Absolutely everything you can come up with. And um, so, yeah, that's that's what I do. And people join the streams. And in Twitch, there's this system of a live chat. So you can actually interact with people at the minute. Like, by the second, you can answer questions. And it's just it's just really great. It's a, it's a big work. I'm not going to lie. I'm saying, like, so it, it requires preparation. I gather images. I prepare the scripts. But I really like it. I think it's very satisfactory, at least for me. So everyone's welcome to join. Do, do you find a sort of a, a difference in the audience in terms of what they're interested in um, with, you know, people on Twitch versus somebody that you'd, say, talk to in your department or at an academic conference or, or, or something like that? Do you, do you find that different aspects of your research uh, hold more or less, uh, you know, captivate people more or less in, in different settings? Definitely. I, I'm a little bit of a rara avis, we say in, in, in Spanish, which is Latin, which is like an odd bird in the sense <laughs> that I do mythology. And yeah, that's the pun. Absolutely. Puns, quips and jokes. Absolutely intended. And um Normally, mythology is not something people, academic people, tend to be interested in. Some people are definitely, but generally, you know, the general discourse is much more about historiography, architecture, illustration, but not so much about mythology, and definitely not mythology that, that does not revolve around humans, because. I'm a little bit done with humanity, so I turn to the jinn, to see more, to the dragons. You know, the supernatural, it's much fun. <laughs> so um, so I think they are, and also there is this concept that academia is difficult and the more convoluted, the more intricate, the better. And I do not think that applies I, I think one of the best compliments I've been given since I started the Twitch channel and built my community is that I make, again, I said this before, I make 
approachable, the daunting of history. And uh, I believe that's exactly the reason I started everything. It's just because it's not it's my way of saying this is not difficult. It might look like it's difficult, but it's really interesting and it's very nice. And I want to share this with you. And of course, you need to select your topics for attracting the audience. For example, one of the one of the streams that I enjoyed a lot when the new Assassin's Creed Valhalla was released, I did my own suggesting to Ubisoft five ideas for an Assassin's Creed based in Iranian history. That was so much fun. I also, in one of the streams, I made a bestiary. I listed uh, creatures from Iranian mythology in medieval ages. Uh, for Halloween, I covered a bunch of demons from Mesopotamian texts. Um, people love seeing... The, Twitch is very visual, and we are in this time in a very visual consuming like, like image consuming culture so they like tours a lot i've toured esfahan in iran i've toured tehran i've toured shiraz and they like seeing it it's because it feels especially since the pandemic uh, started because people could not go outside we would go outside in our own terms and i would show them these buildings and talk about the people behind them uh, another thing that is very popular in my channel is astronomy, anything linked to the stars and to the um, like science in the Islamic world. They really like it. And Zoroastrianism is a big thing. They really like to know about Zoroastrian deities. And, and um, I try to focus not so much on the battles and, you know, like canonical history because you can find them more accessibly. There's a lot of videos on YouTube about Genghis Khan, about uh, Cyrus, about Darius. So let's talk about something else, you know, like art. I do a lot of things about, uh, I've done music as well. So it's this, this topics, but actually I, on Patreon, one of the perks my patrons have is that they can choose themselves. So I just prepare a bunch of uh, topics and I ask, Hey, what would you like to see for the next month? And then they choose and uh, that's what we do. So one of the things I also wanted to ask you uh, is that you, you you mentioned you know multiple uh, uh, you you speak multiple languages. Your your Spanish, your English is is very very good. Um, oh, thank you. And, and I, I I like I do I w I will say I have been appreciating the the kind of the mixed accent that you have as as someone living in the, <laughs> in America. You have this kind of you know uh, British accent sort of overlaid on top of a uh, a Spanish accent, which is uh, do you know Which what? I used to be very ashamed of me having an accent when I was younger because some people growing up, some people, English speaking people, English native speakers, they would make fun of me and that made me ashamed of my accent. And then I thought to hell with it. Of course, I do have an accent because I speak more than one language. You know, it, people... People tend to make fun of accents I, I, until I remember uh, I, I was, this is a brief digression, but I was actually in Spain. I do not speak Spanish, but I was trying very, very hard. Um, and we Spanish, point. I appreciate and, that. <laughs> and uh, I was hitchhiking and this, uh, these, these two kids in the back, the, you know, the dad had picked me up. Uh, two kids in the back were laughing at my uh, poor attempts at Spanish um, until the dad said, well, you know, if you guys laugh at his Spanish, uh, why don't you guys try speaking English? And that <laughs> that shut them Parenting up. Parenting so. down properly. <laughs> if anyone if anyone makes fun of your accent, just you know, just get them to speak Spanish, and I'm sure they'll they'll change your their tune pretty quickly. Oh, um, that's very I, I, <laughs> I did I did want to ask you though about you know presenting in those. Two languages. Uh, obviously, you're talking about. I, I, I assume you, you you spend a lot of time with the Persian language as well when you're uh, when you're talking about you know when you're. When I'm you're getting doing there. Research. I'm not fluent in Persian whatsoever. <laughs> please, please do not make me speak in Persian, please. <laughs> we won't. We're not going to quiz you. We're not going to quiz you today. But uh, um, with with you know translating uh, you know each into into each language and and you know, thinking in each language, I guess, you know, first of all, do you think that you are, uh, you know, a different presenter, you present different things in English versus Spanish? And then do you think the audiences and the communities um, have a different perspective on what it is that you're presenting? 
That is very interesting because, all right, let's just answer the first one. I do not present different things because what I do in English, I do in Spanish because I there's a lot of work. I used to do different things, but I could not produce two scripts, two original scripts a week. Jesus, that was, no, <laughs> that was a little bit too much. <laughs> but um, I, for example, in English, my discourse is much more formal because I am used to the academic English and uh, I do not know that many slang or expressions, whereas in Spanish is my mother tongue and I use all kinds and variety of crazy local expressions and uh, idioms and just I love them and I wish my knowledge in English was a little bit better to do so. I am, you know, getting there. Also, I started, I keep on continuing, I continued with uh, with the English streams because it helped me, uh, because I also teach, I used to teach and it helped me develop my own speech as I as I went. You know, it, it helps you, um, it helps you improvise quite a lot. And uh, as, uh, just in case anyone has noticed yet, I like speaking Boy, do I like speaking like a parrot. I love it. So I I just took advantage of all my, you know, I just thought about my fortress when I um, was thinking about this. Regarding the audiences, I don't know because, uh, so here's the fun thing. Here's a fun fact. I actually have a lot of Spanish speakers that come to listen to me in English because they want to improve their listening. I'm not making this up. <laughs> I should be charging for English classes, but I am not. So, uh, and then the people from um, English uh, backgrounds, or at least that they communicate mainly in English with me, I don't know. They tend to be less interactive. I don't know if that would have to do with everyone's personality or it was just my audience, but the people who interact, they do interact a lot. Whereas the people who, who don't and come, they would say come, but they would not ask questions or, you know, just sit and enjoy, which is, you know, fair. You can do that too. Um, in, in Spanish, there's people is more chatty with me. Don't know if they feel more familiar towards me or something like that. But I don't know. I'm really happy with my community, you know. But Cha, if you're hearing me, I love you so much. All of you, you, you are the reason I'm here. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. Absolutely no. It, I, I think it's it is interesting. Uh, there's there's the stereotype of um, you know Spanish speakers being more kind of open, yeah, and chatty and friendly, um, you know, compared to English speakers and uh, sort of, <laughs> yeah. you know, Northern and, and, and uh, you know, Western Europe, you know, uh, as a whole, which obviously is a stereotype. You get people, you know, on all ends, but uh, I guess to a certain extent that that also seems to match with your, your uh, response, your response on your streams as well. I think it really depends also on the day or the topic because some topics would attract people much more than others, which is, you know, that happens also in Spanish. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a difference and I can't see how I am a different presenter in the sense that, well, I can know I am not, I do not define myself as bilingual in the sense that I learned English. I was not talking English since I was a baby, if that makes any sense. So I haven't, I wasn't brought up with English as part of my way of expressing myself. And um, therefore, this is an acquired skill. Whereas Spanish is not a skill, it's just my natural self. So <laughs> I don't know if that doesn't make any sense. Oh boy, what are we saying? Ah, no, we were talking about the gym. <laughs> <laughs> so I still laugh in Spanish. I do not know how to <laughs> laugh in English. I, I actually have no idea if that's even possible, but I do laugh in Spanish. So with the with the the projects that you've been doing um you have a you know very kind of public facing twitch and you know podcast and blog and all that what has the response been from your your academic peers are, are people you know saying oh that's cool oh you know uh, how do you do that maybe asking for advice or uh, do people wonder you know what's the point uh what 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 has the been the 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 response so i haven't had much response in the sense that for example my supervisor one of my supervisors uh, she knows and she really likes it uh, she 
she doesn't come often, but she likes that I'm doing this. She thinks it's very nice and good. All the people have mixed feelings about it, but I rarely talked to them. I, uh, hey, by the way, I would like to say hello to my friend Rowena uh, from Iranian Studies Collective. For example, Rowena is a young academic and she loves it. And I, she's interviewed me for her YouTube channel, Follow the Iranian Studies Collective. And, um, and uh, she likes this kind of thing and she loves this kind of, of approach. Also, there's Robert Houghton from the Public Medievalist and uh, the Middle Ages in Video Games projects. And he knows of this and he, of course, he's also into these kind of public engagement projects because I don't know if you knew about this, but they, this is just one example, they organized this conference through Twitter about Middle Ages and representation in video games and history and art. And it's amazing because it has a lot, a lot of participants and it's through Twitter. So I think it's amazing. It's a really, it's a way of making it public and accessible to everyone because you don't have to pay, you don't have to be registered. I um, So there's, I can see how in the academic world, there's still a very conservative sector of academics that just, they would not even consider this kind of things as a thing. But a lot of younger uh, people, and maybe not necessarily younger, but just like other people with older perspectives would really like it. As I say, I haven't had much academic input into this, but I, I do not hide it. For example, when I go to conferences or when I uh, talk about my research or when I'm being asked, I mention this because it's important to me and it's an effort and uh, it's uh, it's something I'm very proud of if I'm allowed to say this. Um I would love more people would engage in these kind of projects like you guys have with the Ask Historians. I really like it. I love it because to me, that's the reason we're here. We're not writing all these papers and books to show off to all the colleagues. No, we, in my head, my idealistic self, I wish all of this would be accessible to people and they could read it. That would be, that. that's the thing we research for, to share with other people. Or at least as a reason I do that. And, um, there's just so many cool, cool stories around. We kind of just have them for ourselves. It's it, one of the reasons why, you know, obviously this, this has been so, you know, interesting for me. And, and, you know, one of the reasons we had you on is, is exactly that. I mean, ask historians, you know, the project is based around that exact concept, you know, being and that's the reason share I am a big fan. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I am <laughs> a big you. fan. And uh, I I follow your topics and I learned on how <laughs> I learned how to use Reddit for you guys. <laughs> because it was a foreign language to me. And I was like, what is this witchcraft? And actually through you I was in contact with I am gonna butcher his surname so badly. Well I'm gonna try my best. Here I go. Royal Koninen Dyke? That's he'll he'll be he'll be you you got you got, yeah, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, I think Is uh, it? He'll, he'll All be right, glad thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Dr. Koninen Koninen Dyke I can't do that again. I jinx it. I'd say it's all good for me. So I did these uh live stream on Hold on to your seat, the Battle of Thermopylae. Dun, dun, dun. Uh. And of course I your your podcast about the Battle of Thermopylae and all the reading they were suggesting. It was just amazing because as you can imagine, I no, I was not pro-Iranian in my speech. I was at much more like, guys, let's just remind ourselves that the 300 is a movie based on a movie, which is based in a, in a, in a comic. So it's just, you know, there's this, this movie, comic, film, and it's, it's not real, it's not accurate. It's actually unpack what happened here and also i was that was a stream i enjoyed so much because i was fighting against many stereotypes like you know the propaganda and these horrible concepts of the west and the east you know the orient and occident existing already in um oh, 180 before common era that wasn't a thing i just the persians were doing the persian things and the greeks were doing the greek things please do not come <laughs> at me i have done my research and um I really enjoyed and I loved having something as your podcast and your Reddit entrance with all the recommendations so I can go browse it. And at that minute, I just knew it was something great because I thought anyone could be in my shoes at the minute. Anyone just feeling <laughs> the need of listening to someone. And that is 
where the magic happens. Because uh, like Hannah Montana, we get the best of both worlds because we have communicators and we have academics because we've done our research. We know our stuff. We know our way around sources and artistic pieces and archaeological reminding, uh, remaining, sorry. And then we share it. Ta-da! And yes, that was a that, that was a reference to Hannah Montana. That, I was me. just going to say that that is uh, I don't know if I've had somebody compare a public facing historian to Hannah Montana um, on the I'm podcast or elsewhere. You. But I I <laughs> think that's I think that's wonderful. I think that's <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for all of you. Come at me. I'm waiting with a warm tea teapot full of tea, and we'll invite you to have a glass with me. Yes. <laughs> So um, before before we go, where can people learn more? Uh, I, you, you sent me a, a link tree that I will definitely put up there that has a, a ton of different links um, on there that will be included in the uh, Reddit post that accompanies this uh, podcast. I'm going to be in a Reddit but... post. <laughs> <laughs> I scored. I scored so bigly. Um, but how uh, how can people find you? What what can people look up? Where can people find you? And um, and all that. Okay, so if people want to engage with the Twitch and with the streams, I can be found as Las Plumas de Simur, which I know it's in Spanish, but hey, you read much more difficult things when you read Fantasy by Brandon Sanderson and Tolkien. So relax, you can do Spanish. <laughs> so uh, you can find me on Twitch and also on Instagram and Twitter. And maybe if you really, really like the project and if you want to consider supporting it, you can find me also on Patreon. And um, yeah, I would love to welcome any person interested uh, in uh, in Iran and in Islam and uh, in fighting Islamophobia and, uh, you know, in, in creating this. We have an amazing community. I know if I'm allowed to say this, but they are. They, my bacha are the best. I mean, bacha is a word in Persian that means boys and girls, like guys or people. And normally, literally, is used for little kid because bache means kid. Like little kid. However, when used for a group of people, it's like, hey guys, so hey bacha. It's like the bacha is the word I use to address my audience, and I love them, and they are the best. So if you listener, if you wish to become a bacha, we're waiting for you. Full wings expanded, full arms open. We are very nice, and they're just the best. I'm very grateful for my community. I have to say that. So yeah, that's it. Instagram, Twitter, and um, Twitch. Patriot, you, there's the link in this beautiful post that Tyler is going to assemble. So, yeah. And also, if you want to send me uh, like a DM or something, I try to respond to everything. I'm very approachable. I'm not mad, I swear. I mean, <laughs> I think. I don't know. Maybe a little bit. I mean, I work with the supernatural, so maybe something has trespassed the limit. The al is entered into me. But to be completely honest, who would dare to venture in the academic world without being a little nuts that's very very true uh well <laughs> uh laura castro royo um who is uh, runs the las plumas de simur um a project also a phd candidate at the university of st andrews in scotland thank you so much for coming on to the ask historians podcast thanks to you tyler i had the best time i really hope you you enjoy i heard you laugh so i met you i think you had a good time too i want to ask i'm gonna go home with, with that thought and yeah thank you so much if you ever want to talk about all the orientalistic stuff or if you're curious about many of the creatures that i mentioned just like please give me a call again i would love to be here with you and yeah thank you so much for inviting me i am very grateful well, thank you very much, and thank you for listening. Uh, we will see you next week. I'm Tyler Alderson, and you've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook, and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history. 